Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Neuroscience and Education webinar series. I am Betsy Hill, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Brainware Company, and I want to welcome you to our uh, webinar today on the cognitive impact of poverty and what educators can do. As we uh, go through the presentation, um, I want to let you know that we are happy to share the slides from this presentation and also to answer questions. Since this is a recording, you're not going to be able to enter anything into the chat window as we would normally do. But if you are interested in receiving a copy of the slides and or if you have questions regarding the presentation, if you would uh, email them to me and I'm going to provide my email information at the end of the presentation. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, first, we're going to walk through an overview of three areas of research, types of research on poverty in the brain. And then we're going to look at what we can do as educators. This is a picture, of course, of a brain. And it's not going to tell us a lot about brain function, but it is going to represent the perspective we are going to take today. And most importantly, how our brains develop. Each of us is born with a brain that comprises about 100 billion neurons. Um, those are the cells, the basic cells in our brains. And our brains develop by connecting those neurons together and creating trillions and trillions of connections among those neurons. While this growth is guided by genetics, it is also very important to understand the impact of the environment. And the environment is far more than incidental. And that is the environment is it's our interaction with uh, the environment that causes our brains to grow and develop. Before we get into that research, it's going to be helpful to review just a few principles of brain function. This is an illustration of neurons and how they connect to each other. Each neuron in the normally developing brain has about 6,000 dendrites. And they are like tree branches that extend out from the cell body. And they're so numerous that they account for about 90% of the surface of the cell. They communicate, uh, so the neurons actually communicate with each other through electrical and chemical signals. And this communication is the basis of all human behavior. Each neuron has an axon that communicates to other cells via that cell's dendrites. And you can see that the axon of the neuron on the left has what is labeled as a myelin sheath. Myelin is a fatty coating that speeds up the electrical signal that travels down the axon. And we'll see why that's important in a little bit. This is an actual slide of brain tissue enlarged many, many times. And what you're seeing here, all those little black dots that you can see are the uh, cell bodies of the neurons. And 30,000 neurons would fit on the head of a pin. All of these neurons and their connections are what people refer to when they talk about gray matter in our brain. The white matter refers to the myelin sheath that we just talked about that coats the uh, brain as it develops to get it to be faster and more efficient at uh, communicating. Early brain growth is absolutely fascinating. So during the first nine months of fetal development, or during the nine months of fetal development, neurons grow at the rate of 250,000 per minute. So that happens very quickly. And in fact, um, while it's doing that, it actually overproduces neurons. And what the brain does before birth is get rid of the less effective and less healthy neurons. And it keeps the very best ones so that when we're born, we're born with about 100 billion of them. And the brain weighs about a pound or so at birth. By our first birthdays, our brains have doubled in weight and size. And by age five or six, our brains are 90% of their adult size and weight. So really raises the question, what causes this tremendous growth in such a short time? And I'm going to give you a hint that the answer is not more neurons. Essentially, we're born with all the neurons that we will ever have. Um, there are a couple of exceptions to that, uh, but in general, it's not, we are not producing a, a huge number of new neurons. So the question is, what causes this uh, tremendous growth in our brains? 
And the answer is if you thought about connecting more connections among neurons, you were absolutely right. So here are slides of actual brain tissue from the cortex of the brain at birth on the left and at two years old on the right. And they show very graphically what happens in the brain um, as it grows. And this is actually a picture of learning. Um, at two, there are many, many more connections, of course, as you can see, than there were at birth. And what will happen is that the brain has actually overproduced connections at the age of two and will start to prune them away. And this overproduction of connections and subsequent pruning or this, this really um, accelerated uh, uh, incidence of that happens twice in the development of the brain, the first time at the age of two and the second time during adolescence. It's important to understand that even though these two periods are, of development are remarkable, it is important um, that the, you, we understand that the brain is continually growing, making and strengthening and pruning connections throughout our lifetimes. So what is it that causes all of the creation of connections and synapses? As we said before, it is a combination of genetics and environment. And to understand more about how crucial the environment is, we're going to take a look at some research by Marion Diamond. In the 1960s, Marion Diamond, Mark Rosenzweig, and their colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, demonstrated that substantial changes in the brain's architecture can be influenced by an animal's environment. Uh, later, William Greenow at the University of Illinois extended that research on enriched environments. And in this case, enrichment for the rats in both of these studies was provided by placing a colony of rats together in a large cage with toys that were changed every few days. So the picture on the left is, is an example of the impoverished environment where the rat has sufficient food and water, but really nothing to play with and no one to socialize with. On the right, of course, is a cage that has toys and things for the rat to climb on. So based on what we've been talking about, what do you think the differences would be that the researchers found as they compared the rats, the brains of the rats who were raised in these different environments? So um, as you might anticipate, the brains of the rats in the enriched environment had more branching of dendrites and somewhat increased cell weight. Moreover, these structural changes in the rat's brains resulted in their being better able to solve complex maze problems. So it's not just structure, it's also what they're able to do. Diamond also reported that wild rats obtained from their natural environment had even more dendritic growth and heavier cortices than the lab rats, even those raised in enriched environments. One of the other important things is that Diamond also found the same results no matter whether the rats were infants, adolescents, middle-aged, or elderly. Um, and in fact, you know, we can go through the life cycle of a rat in 600 to 900 days, so we don't have to wait 90 years as we would for, for adults or for our humans. Uh, but in the impoverished environment, the exact opposite thing occurs. And Dr. Diamond found that if rats were moved from an enriched environment to an impoverished environment, Neurons decreased in size, dendrites shriveled, and in extreme impoverishment, actually neurons were lost. As recent research has shown, the human brain is affected by the environment in much the same way. This is a CT scan from Bruce Perry of the brain of a normal child and one who has suffered extreme neglect. In this case, even the size of the brain has been affected. And I want to emphasize that this is extreme neglect. But as we will see, we have to really consider the likelihood that children from disadvantaged backgrounds have not experienced the same kinds of richness in their environments and that that will actually affect brain growth and um, the connections and all that gray matter. And in fact, this chart is from a recent, very recently published study conducted by Jamie Hansen at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. This study used MRIs to measure the amount of gray matter in the brains of children. In this study, socioeconomic status was uh, measured as total family income, which ranged for these subjects from 4% to 400% of the federal poverty level. 
What the researchers found was more gray matter by volume in the brains of children from higher SES and less in those from lower socioeconomic status. It turns out that the same was true of white matter, which is that myelin coating. So both the number of connections among the neurons as well as that coating. So higher SES is correlated with more neuronal connections and more efficient connections. As we will see later, this was especially true in certain parts of the brain. But first, one other study that has received a lot of attention. This is uh, from research by Joan Luby of the Washington University in St. Louis and was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. This study looked at MRI scans of children from different levels of economic status, and it used the income to needs ratio, which just means the total family income divided by the federal poverty level based on family size. So this study was designed to measure the contribution of that ratio to brain volume. As in the University of Wisconsin research, both gray matter and white matter correlated with socioeconomic status. And there were some other really important findings from this research. One of the areas of the brain where the differences were significant in the MRI scans was the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a brain structure highlighted in this picture and is involved in short-term memory storage retrieval, and in the consolidation of long-term memory. So differences in hippocampal volume were also seen in the University of Wisconsin study. So think just for a moment about what it would mean for a child from a low-income family if we know that the part of the brain that helps encode memory is less well-developed. The University of Wisconsin study also measured differences in other parts of the brain and found them in the frontal lobes and in the parietal lobes. The frontal lobes of our brain are important for executive functions, such as planning, impulse control, and control of attention, problem solving. And the parietal lobes play an important role in sensory integration, aspects of visual attention, and can be especially important for connectivity among brain regions. So now we really understand that there is strong evidence that poverty affects the brain's physical structure and development. And next we're going to take a look at the research on how brain actually, um, our brains actually perform those functions and how that's affected by uh, socioeconomic status and poverty. What we're going to look at here is the research by Kimberly Noble uh, when she was at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. She is now at Columbia University Medical Center. This research was published in 2007 in Developmental Science and documented deficits or differences across multiple brain systems for low socioeconomic status students. Um, a significant correlation was found for all of these cognitive systems uh, between socioeconomic status, and here uh, that was the um, estimated by parental education, occupation, and income, and so that combination uh, is what the researchers used to um, compare to uh, cognitive functioning. The first area of difference that you see here has to do with the language system. And that won't be surprising to most educators who are familiar with and have been for some time uh, with the work on vocabulary and language deficits identified by Hart and Risley, in which hearing child, uh, children from low SES heard 300, 3 million, no, 30 million, 30 million fewer words before age three. You'd think it would be three, but the actual number is 30 million. If our brain systems develop in interaction with our environment, then we would expect the area of processing words and vocabulary and learning vocabulary to be less well-developed if, in fact, we hear fewer words and hear less vocabulary. Just makes sense. But now we know that the impact on brain systems and on cognitive functioning is not just about hearing 30 million fewer words the deficits impact other brain systems as well, and you're seeing them here. So consider the impact of an economically disadvantaged student not being able to perceive visual spatial relationships and patterns as well. 
Consider the impact of that student having a less efficient system to form new memories, that is, to learn. Uh, this echoes, of course, the findings regarding the hippocampus that we saw in the brain scan studies. So we see it both in the brain scans and here in the cognitive tests. Uh, consider the impact of having more limited working memory, which we use to solve problems and manipulate information, and as we'll talk in a moment, has a big impact on reading comprehension. And finally, what will be the impact of having less attentional and inhibitory control? These cognitive processes are the foundation of learning, and the research really shows us that students from low SES come to our classrooms with less well-developed brains. Their brains are physiologically and functionally different from their more advantaged peers. Now, as we're going to see that, while well, it sounds like it could be fairly depressing, um, actually has a very happy outcome and very happy, uh, a much more positive um, potential than we've ever seen before, and we're going to move into that shortly. So far, we have been talking about some very broad areas of processing, and now we're going to shift to be able to look at some specific cognitive functions which we can connect then to academic performance. This is a chart that we use uh, to talk about cognitive skills. So down at the very bottom, in that bottom box, are a group of cognitive skills that we refer to as foundational. These are things like our attention skills, our visual processing, our processing speed, uh, some of our very short-term memory, simultaneous and sequential processing. These are the basic ways we get information into our brains from the outside world. They function at a non-conscious level, and for the most part, we're not even aware of them taking place. Uh, if they're functioning effectively and efficiently, that's great. We'll be in good shape to start that learning process, but if not, of course, we're going to have issues at that very first step. On top of the foundational cognitive skills is a group of cognitive processes that are now being referred to as executive functions. Uh, we find that educators are uh, generally much more familiar these days with executive functions for good reason, because they are highly correlated with academic success and, in fact, with a lot of long-term life success, health outcomes, a whole range of things. So the core executive functions that we're going to be talking about are working memory, which refers to our ability to hold information in our mind while we manipulate it. Inhibitory control, which is pretty much what it sounds like. So you, when you stop yourself from punching somebody when you're mad at them. Uh, but it also refers to a more long-term inhibitory control and ability, for example, to defer gratification. And then finally, cognitive flexibility. So cognitive flexibility refers to the ability to change our mindset when the rules of the world around us change. Or, for example, when we learn something new about the world, that the world works differently than we thought, and we have to shift the way, our mental model, if you will, the way that we think about it. And finally, on top of that are higher order executive functions, which include things like reasoning and problem solving and planning. And of course, this is where we want all our students to be able to get to whatever set of standards we're trying to live up to. And what we're seeing in this model is that all of these cognitive skills, this underlying cognitive infrastructure, if you will, is necessary for reading, necessary for math. Uh, learning to read, learning to do math, every, and all the rest of the things that rely on that really rests on top of this cognitive infrastructure. But teachers are often asked to teach reading and teach math and teach all those other things without really having any idea whether their students have this underlying cognitive capacity. And even if they suspect that they don't or there are issues, uh, there hasn't been a lot that they could do about it. So we're going to just spend a little bit more time um, talking about how these cognitive processes connect specifically to reading and math. So if you ask most educators what the basics of reading are, you will probably hear something like decoding, fluency, and comprehension. And indeed, these are critical skills for reading. We can't be good readers without them. But they are also not really the most basic. There is, in fact, no decoding part of our brain. In order to decode, there are a number of different cognitive processes that have to be functioning together all at the same time in order for us to decode. 
So, for example, if I can't sustain my attention, if my mind goes wandering off in the middle of trying to decode a word, or if I can't visually discriminate in thousandth of a second between a B and a P or an M and an N, if my brain doesn't keep them in the right order as those as that information comes into it, or I can't have good auditory discrimination among different sounds, uh, then decoding is going to be problematic. For fluency, there are skills like visual span, how much information we can take in at a glance, flexible attention, shifting that attention smoothly from one word to the next or one line to the next, or processing speed, which can play a role in fluency. And comprehension, of course, is where the rubber really meets the road. Uh, we, we need our students to be able to really understand what they're reading so that eventually they read to learn and not just learn to read. Um, and this is where cognitive processes, especially things like working memory and visualization, are critical. So, for example, if I am reading a text and I have the topic in my mind, and as I read along, I add in dis different uh, pieces of information and hold them together, that happens in working memory. If I encounter a word or a concept that I don't understand and I have to think about it or ask someone for some information and then bring that back and attach it and uh, hold it together with that information that I was already getting from reading, that happens in working memory. If I'm consciously processing and connecting this information to what I already know, which is really what comprehension is all about, it's creating meaning, which I do by connecting it to previous knowledge, that also happens in working memory. And so without good working memory capacity, without the ability to visualize a scene or a set of relationships among concepts, comprehension is going to be very, very limited. The same principles apply in math. If we think about some of the basic uh, processing areas of spatial representations, the ability, that is the ability to understand shapes and their locations in space, to extract information from a chart or a graph, those kinds of things obviously have cognitive components from some of these skills that we've been talking about. Uh, information manipulation, I used to refer to this as story problems, but um, as we know today, pretty much all of math is a story problem. We no longer solve sterile equations. We actually uh, want to have it be an application to understand the real life, real world application of what we're doing. And so keeping track of where we are in solving a problem um, and really understanding that problem, of course, is working memory and sequential processing and those kinds of things. And then ultimately, math is very logical. And so our ability to reason and to draw inferences and all of those kinds of things are going to be very important. So all of these skills, of course, um, some commonalities uh, between reading and math. We don't have two brains. We have a single brain. And we need all of these skills to be able to be effective learners. So putting this all together, what we know is that um, the brains of our at low SES students are functionally and physiologically different. And even when they get into a situation where they have good teaching and good curriculum and a safe environment, it still will take them longer to learn what they must to survive and thrive in an academic setting. But, and of course this is the important punchline, the very plasticity that developed their brains the way that they did can be harnessed to overcome those initial deficits. Students with less cognitive ability can still develop it. So that's where we're going to start. Now we're going to tackle the second part of the webinar on what educators can do. And it's this part is divided really into two sections. First of all, actually providing an intervention that can help accelerate the development of cognitive processes and remediate some of those deficits. And then secondly, how we can adapt instructional practice and how we interact with our students to help address some of these issues. So when we talk about cognitive interventions, until fairly recently, the only thing that educators or parents could do was to arrange for a student to work with a clinician, like a speech pathologist, an occupational therapist, or some other kind of learning specialist. And that kind of intervention is, can be very effective, but it's typically also very expensive. 
However, there's a tool called Brainware Safari that has taken the best practices of those disciplines, in fact, multiple disciplines, and combined them and incorporated them into a computer-based program, and in fact, delivered as if it were a video game. Um, it comprehensively develops the skills that we've been talking about in that pyramid of cognitive capacity and infrastructure. So I'm going to share with you some of the research of the program's impact on students' cognitive capacity and how that translates to academic performance. As we discussed um, and go through some of this research, um, I want you to keep in mind that the recommended protocol usage for the program is three to five times a week, about 30 to 45 minutes per session over about 12 weeks. And that is the protocol that was used in these following studies. One of the first studies of brainware with low SES students took place in Indianapolis, Indiana. These were fourth and fifth grade boys with a history of discipline problems, and the district, in their infinite wisdom, had decided to put them all in a single school for this particular uh, school year. Uh, the pre and the post test was the Woodcock-Johnson Cognitive Battery. Uh, many educators are familiar with that. It's often used to assess the cognitive ability across a variety of different um, cognitive processing areas uh, for students who may be struggling. Um, each bar on this chart represents one student, and the red line indicates the physical age of the student. The blue bar represents the cognitive age of the student on the Woodcock-Johnson pretest. So as you can see, virtually all of the students performed lower than their actual age on the test. In fact, an average of three years behind. I often hear teachers talk about low SES students coming into their classroom two to three years behind academically. And as we saw in this study and in, in other studies, they're also usually behind cognitively. So the classroom teachers then used Brainware Safari with these students for 12 weeks. And this is how the students did on the post-test. So the second darker blue bar is their post-test result. All of the students, as you can see, improve their cognitive ability, most of them surpassing what would be expected for students their age. These were not dumb kids. They had the potential. But what they didn't have was the developed cognitive capacity to succeed in school. And when you're not succeeding in school, you can imagine what the outcome is. They tend to shut down or they tend to act out. And the connection between school struggles and uh, behavioral and discipline issues um, is pretty well understood by, by most teachers. I should point out that while there was not a control group in this study, other studies with control groups have been done. And in those, the growth for the students not having the cognitive intervention or not using brainware was generally consistent with with maturation. So over a three-month period, we would typically see three to four months of cognitive growth, and that's what we see in the control groups. What we're seeing in the groups using brainware is anything from two to six years of cognitive growth over the 12-week period. In this case, most of the students were able to return to other schools, some of them magnet schools, the following year. A question that often gets asked is whether the gains in cognitive functioning are sustained after students using, stop using the program. Uh, these are results from a study in Canada with a low SES uh, district uh, using another test, in this case the Canadian Cognitive Abilities Test. There's a U.S. counterpart for that, which is called the COGAT. Uh, many districts in the U.S. use the COGAT to evaluate students for a gifted program. The COGAT and the CCAT both have three subtests, a verbal, a quantitative, and a nonverbal. Scores on those subtests are then combined into an overall composite score. If I were in Canada, I would say composite. And uh, the scores are then expressed as percentiles, uh, age percentile rankings, in fact. So in this study, the students took the CCAT in September, and they used Brainware Safari in the fall between September and January uh, for 12 weeks, took the CCAT again in January. Then they did not use the program in the winter and the spring and took the CCAT again in June. 
As you can see, the gains immediately following use of BrainWare Safari were continued or sustained after the students uh, stopped using the program. These results are very consistent with what we've seen uh, with other studies with the COGAT. Um, in addition, I can tell you that there was a control group in the study and the growth experienced by the BrainWare group was significantly better than the control. I also want to point out that these students started, if you look at the composite score, at an average uh, below the 40th percentile in September. In June, the average score was at the 70th percentile. Students who score at the 70th percentile or higher are predicted to be successful in school without any special adjustment to the curriculum or instruction. Their odds of graduating and going on to college are much higher. So there's a, a tremendous difference between uh, a group of students performing at the 40th and a group of students performing at the 70th percentile. In addition to the CCAT, the schools in Canada also administered the Canadian uh, Test of Basic Skills. Here the scores are expressed as grade equivalents. The average scores on the test were on average a bit below grade level at the beginning of the year, but significantly above grade level at the end of the year. So again, these cognitive skills are translating into improved academic performance. I'm going to share one more study with you. We don't have time for all of the 20-some studies uh, with BrainWare that have been completed. In this case, it's not um, because these students were low SES, but because they were students who have been diagnosed as having a specific learning disability. And SLD means that there's a deficit in a cognitive process, of course, that stands in the way of their being, uh, making good academic progress. Um, and I'm going to look at this particular study because we're going to look at some specific cognitive areas um, that low SES would have in common with this population. The study also included a control group and used the Woodcock-Johnson cognitive battery as the pre and the post test. Here, the researcher translated those scores into something called a relative proficiency index. And what that really means is that a 90% RPI would, is what would be expected of a normally developing student. The other thing to note here is that these students, uh, because they had been classified as SLD, were receiving the reading and math interventions that they were entitled to receive in their school, but only the BrainWare group received the cognitive intervention. You can see that there was little change cognitively for the control group, as we would expect. Well, the BrainWare group scored at 89% proficiency on the post-test, virtually closing the gap to normally developing. And you can see the impact it had on reading and math. In, in this case, it was eight-tenths of a grade equivalent in, in uh, reading and a full grade equivalent in math in those 12 weeks between the tests. Dr. Abson, who was the researcher in this case, also broke down the cognitive scores into the subtest areas of the Woodcock-Johnson. And here is where we can connect back to the findings of the brain scans and the cognitive research. These students had deficits in those same areas, working memory, attention, and executive functions. But these are deficits that can be remediated. In all of these areas, using BrainWare Safari helped these students to perform cognitively close to, or in some cases, even above the level of normally developing students. So cognitive intervention will be one key to helping low SES students develop the cognitive capacity for learning. But there's some other areas that educators should pay special attention to. And the first that we're going to talk briefly about are deficits in prior knowledge. So teachers of low SES students often comment that their students don't have the background or experiences that they need to learn the curriculum. When that is the case, then they must provide the background, and sometimes that involves teaching explicitly things that are otherwise taken for granted. Those can include things like table manners or historical facts, nursery rhymes, um, and, and other skills. Uh, one educational therapist that I know identified propositions as being a problem for a group of low SES students that she worked with. 
that made it difficult for them to read certain kinds of text. And here is an example. This is a text from a sixth grade basal science text with the prepositions highlighted. So even just glancing at the text in this way, you can appreciate how difficult it would be for a student to visualize the structure of a bone that is being described without a solid command of prepositions. So this therapist developed symbols to help connect the prepositions to their meaning. Going across the first row here, the symbol stands for from, to, above, beneath, inside, and through. And then, of course, there are a variety of other symbols for different definition uh, prepositions that she, she developed. So the student then is asked to label the prepositions with their pictorial representations, to find those prepositions and to connect them with the symbols that they uh, that represent them. Now, reading the text with these cues is likely to provide a more effective understanding of the relationship among the parts and structures of the bone. Another area that educators should be paying attention to with all students, but is often particularly important with low SES students, is the role of emotions in learning. Emotions play a really important role in learning, both negative and positive. And most teachers don't need neuroscience to tell us that. Uh, it seems pretty intuitive. But the neuroscience does underscore why it is so important. Uh, learning situations are very threatening for some students, and particularly those with underdeveloped cognitive capacity. When you're not necessarily processing everything as it comes along, every learning situation raises the question, will I look stupid? That sets up a fight or flight, fight or flight response. Uh, and what happens at that point is that the cognitive, um, our cognitive processing shuts down. We, we're going to fight or we're going to flee or we're going to freeze. And basically, we do not have the cognitive capacity to really think through to retrieve information, um, and, if, and that is um, obviously not something that's conducive to the learning situation. So classrooms must be physically and psychologically safe, especially important from low, for low SES students whose lives outside of the classroom often have uh, components that are also st very stress-producing. But emotions also, this is the flip side, Emotions also help encode information, so we don't want a bunch of passive, uninvolved students. We want to create a learning environment that is highly engaging. Sometimes we want them on the edge of their seats uh, with a little bit of adrenaline. It's not just a stress response. Adrenaline actually helps memories be encoded more strongly. So we want to attach good, positive emotions to the information so that it is easier to retrieve when they need it. So teachers have an important role in taking care of the emotional side of things, getting students to feel safe and providing that extra engagement um, so that we can create really strong learning. When we're talking about low SES students, many of whom live in stressful situations, that um, the safety of the environment, non-threatening environment, is, can be particularly important. We know that stress causes the brain to produce cortisol, a hormone that impedes brain development in excess. Um, a certain amount is not a problem, but uh, chronic stress is, um, does impede brain development. And in fact, stress may be one of the reasons besides the impoverished environment that low SES students are cognitively not as well developed. On the positive side, we want, of course, to work with very hard at getting our students to interact with the material because the learning process is all about growing new neural connections and strengthening those that we need, and that's how we get dendrites growing. Here are a few specific suggestions on creating that safe environment and reducing the effects of the negative emotions. Um, one thing is to avoid putting students on the spot which you can do by having them discuss in groups and then share what the group came up with, using clickers or paddles or um, 
online programs like Socrative is another example where you can get feedback on student understanding without singling anyone out. Uh, and another thing, uh, the last bullet point here comes from research by Cyan Belloc at the University of Chicago, which she discusses in her book, Choke. Students who wrote about their feelings prior to an important test scored better. And the theory of how this works is that it allows students to get the emotions out, on, out of their way onto the paper, um, which frees up space in working memory. Then you're not thinking, oh, my goodness, this is such an important test. What am I going to do? They get it out onto paper. They're often able to um, say, you know what, I'm just going to do the best I can. And then they have more working memory capacity that they can use to think better while they're taking the test. When it comes to fostering positive emotions, making instruction engaging and interactive is important, but it's also good to remember the old phrase, students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Making yourself real to students um, goes a long way toward um, helping that and to reducing the stress responses that otherwise they could carry forward. Uh, there are uh, lots of wonderful stories and examples of how this plays out and how important um, that engagement and that trust between a student and a teacher can help. The final thing I want to suggest, uh, and, and this is really just built on the last concept, is that it's important to understand what the research suggests uh, on the factors that mediate the impact of uh, poverty on the brain. So here are two, uh, you know, both sides of the coin again, the positive and the negative. On the positive side, caregiver support is a very important mediating factor, and teachers and administrators in schools are certainly caregivers when our children are at school. Um, authenticity. Uh, physical exercise, physical exercise is also an important mediating factor in uh, helping brains grow. And um, in this case, getting students up and moving around the room, even if there isn't time for PE. Um, if you can get PE back into the, um, into the school schedule, that would be uh, important as well. And then finally, writing before the test, as I described. On the negative side, stressful, stressful life events, which, uh, of course, pretty much everybody will have at some point or another. Um, kids experience stressful events in their lives while they um, are in our classes, um, particularly a, an issue for many low SES students. Offering a sympathetic ear is more effective than you may realize. Um, nutrition and sleep are other. can affect these uh, factors because they occur outside of the classroom. But we really should be aware of them, and we should know that these are going to um, create difficulties, learning difficulties for our students. Um, when we want to talk about these issues with our students, about nutrition or sleep or these kinds of things, it will be really helpful to help them understand that our concern about these aspects of their lives isn't just be a, about being a busybody or a know-it-all or uh, uh, this is really what you should do. Um, because it's just because we know that these factors affect their learning, and learning is, in fact, our business. So we've had a full agenda today, and we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I would be happy to answer questions uh, if there are any and want to remind you that the slides would be available to anyone who wishes to have a copy of them. Uh, here are, is my contact information, uh, Betsy Hill, bhill at mybrainware.com. Um, and I certainly welcome a re requests for copies of the slides or quest other questions that you may have where I can clarify or provide additional information. I want to thank you very much for spending some time with me today on this webinar. We've enjoyed having you. And we hope to see you sometime soon at another Neuroscience in Education webinar. Thanks so much and have a great day.